So I do want to say, you know, it was interesting in the introduction that my day-to-day -day work is housing homeless people and working with very low-income tenants and passing laws to protect low-income tenants from eviction and displacement. But uh, this book is about something else, and, and, and uh, primarily it's about a different population, and it really came out of the ghost ship fire in Oakland in 2016. How many people remember the ghost ship fire? That's good, because it was almost two years ago. It was December 2nd, 2016, and 36 people who attended a party in an Oakland warehouse died that night because the warehouse had no fire exits or fire suppression system. Only one of them was residents of the ghost ship, but what it said to me that when I, when I read up, heard about that, it was like, how can it be that so many people, young bohemian artist types, were forced to live in dangerous housing in Oakland? Because you remember, Oakland was always the alternative, affordable alternative to San Francisco. Right? You couldn't afford San Francisco, we understand that, but let's move to Oakland. And now people couldn't even afford Oakland. So I started to think, we've done something really wrong. Our progressive cities, and I was thinking at the time of Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco, have really done something wrong that we've passed the strongest rent controls, the strongest tenant protections in the country, but working people in the middle class can't even afford a new generation, can't even afford to live there anymore. So my original plan, I was going to write with these three cities who were some of the biggest votes against Donald Trump, each gave less than 5%. You know, progressive cities, they value inclusion, they support immigrant rights. But then in their land use policies, they weren't practicing inclusion, they weren't promoting racial diversity, and they weren't giving any homes for immigrants. They were denying access and forcing anyone, teachers, nurses, firefighters, janitors, you know, unionized hotel workers, how to do these terrible long commutes, which is terrible for the environment. So I originally was just going to write about those three cities. Then Mayor said, well, maybe you ought to see if this is a national problem. And so I started to look at other cities, and I first looked at my home where I grew up in L.A. and found out things were just terrible there. And then I looked at Seattle. And, you know, I had a friend who I used to work, Sam Dodge, his mother and sister are here today. And, you know, we used to always talk about Seattle, about how Seattle's just affordable, because, you know, it's, it's, it's not the, the place where people go to to maximize profits. It's not the place, I mean, this is grunge, right? This is nirvana. This is not the place where, you know, the stereotypes, and Sam used to explain to me that, you know, people come up to Seattle, they want just like a nine to five job because they want to go to the mountains, they want to go to the, to the river, you know, the lakes, and they want to be out in nature, and it's just, you know, that's why when New York City and San Francisco gentrified dramatically starting in the 1980s, Seattle didn't. Seattle was affordable. We had the dot-com boom in San Francisco, in the Bay Area in the late 90s, but Seattle was affordable after that. And there was this assessment that just, there was a culture of Seattle that put things ahead of money and lifestyle, and they would just never get to be the place where tenants had to worry about being displaced. Well, that doesn't describe the current Seattle. I know you're probably aware of it. Not anyone sees it that way. And uh, there's been a dramatic shift in the last five years. And that's what my book in the chapter in Seattle is about. Uh, how, we all know how Seattle got to this point. The question is, how do you increase affordability and expand opportunity? Uh, my thesis of my book is there's really three core requirements to expand affordability. One, you have to protect existing tenants, which is very hard to do in Seattle because the state doesn't let you have rent control. You know, I spent my whole life on rent control. I don't know what we would do. In San Francisco, if we didn't have rent control, we wouldn't have a single low-income tenant in the city. So that's a challenge for Seattle. Two, you have to protect your rental housing stock, which I think, I haven't heard too many problems about that. But three, cities have to build more housing, which the Bay Area cities do a terrible job in. And when I go around, the city in America, you're gonna be surprised, the, the city in America, the major city that does the best job at building housing is Seattle. But what's happened, and you might say, well then why in the heck are rents so high? Why are home prices, why are they get so high? Well. When Amazon is, average, is, is adding 9,000 jobs per month, which they were doing in 2017, how can you build fast enough to keep up with that? Uh, the jobs housing imbalance, which is so acute in all of the cities I write about, Austin, Minneapolis, Denver, you know, Oakland, 
is really acute in Seattle, and it's gotten better, and that's why home prices are going down. But what I have found about Seattle, and this may again surprise a lot of you, is you have some of the most talented urban thinkers in the United States here in Seattle. You really do. And you're doing some of the most creative things. And I write about the HALA program and how what Seattle had done, because you don't have rent control with your mandatory housing uh, affordability program, MHA, if you don't have any protection for tenants unless you connect it to development, then the smart thing to do, which is what you've done, is say to developers, if you get more height and more units and have affordable ones, then we're protecting tenants and creating affordability. I recommend that for every, every everywhere I speak, every interview I do, I say Seattle's MHA is a national model, particularly for cities that don't have rent control. I don't know how many of you saw this report that your planning commission put out, Neighborhoods for All, I think it was this week. Did you guys see this thing? Amazing what Seattle is trying to do because the whole thesis of Generation Priced Out is we have all these progressive cities that claim they promote inclusion and diversity, but their actual policies do the, uh, the opposite because they're intent on maintaining single-family home zoning, which some of you here may support. But in San Francisco, which is a tenant town, the most powerful political constituency for tenants in the United States, half of our residential land, you can build a 40-foot mansion, but not a fourplex. How many people think that's good policy, by the way? If you're, if you're trying to promote inclusion and you say you want racial diversity, but you say, you know, half our city, if you can afford to build a 40-foot tall mansion, you're in. Fourplex for cheaper units, you're out. Is that progressive? Does anyone think that's progressive? I don't. But that's what San Francisco's current policy is today. And the same is true for all the cities I write about, the dozen cities I write about, where powerful homeowner groups have distorted the entire debate about land use and told the people, the workers who built the city, sorry, take the hour commute. Do people know about where Sacramento, California is? It's the capital of, of California. It's, it's about an hour and a half drive to Berkeley or San Francisco or Oakland. Would you believe there's 120,000 people commuting every day from Sacramento to the Bay Area? Now, that's great for greenhouse gas emissions if you want to promote greenhouse gas emissions, right? I mean, what better strategy for uh, accelerating climate change is it than to tell people, no, we're not going to let you build a fourplex here. We're not going to make a housing affordable in our city where we have light rail and transit. We're going to make you drive for an hour and a half each way. And it's very sad. The traffic jams in L.A. are just uh, mind Have anyone here seen the traffic jams in L.A.? I mean, it's, it's, you think you have bad traffic in Seattle, go visit Los Angeles. Why is that? L.A. had powerful homeowner groups, I described this in the book, that just said, we're not letting anything be built above 30 feet. Berkeley, where I live, major intersections, major thoroughfares, height limit, 35 feet. How can that be for progressive cities to tell people that they can't, shouldn't be allowed to live in their city because they can't afford to buy a million dollar house. Because all the houses in San Francisco are over a million dollars and most of them in Berkeley are over a million. Seattle's heading in that direction. I know you have a, one of the things I argue in the book is that, hey, there's a lot of neighborhoods people always say, well, there's no place to build. But then you have this public land, like the Mercer Mega Block. Do people know what this Mercer Mega Block project? Do people know about that? How many people know about the Mercer Mega Block? Most of you don't even know about this, but Seattle has this huge public land in South Lake Union, right where Amazon is, a real upscale, gentrified area, a great place you want to bring affordable units, right? Because one of the problems we face is sometimes the homeowners will say, yeah, well, build it, you know, build all the low-income housing in this neighborhood. Like, my neighbor's got a lot of low-income housing in the Tenderloin. We have the most. We always support it. We support all housing. But, you know, we need to give middle-class and working-class kids an opportunity to live in higher opportunity neighborhoods with better schools, better social connections, right? Like South Lake Union, isn't that a good neighborhood? People, you know that neighborhood, it's right near Amazon and everything. Well, your city somehow has an RFP out, they wanna sell the land to the highest bidder. Does that make sense if you want inclusion? The city owns the land, they could hand it over to nonprofit groups and they could build on it, 
They could build over a thousand units of affordable housing in South Lake Union. Wouldn't that be great? Let middle class, how about the Amazon janitors? Think they can afford to live in Seattle? But here's housing they could have and they could walk to work. So this is what I mean about how our cities, and we can blame a lot of things on Donald Trump, and we can blame the homeless crisis and the fact that people who don't have jobs are homeless or unhoused, ill housed because 75% of eligible households in this country for federal assistance do not get it. Just think about that. 75% of the households in this country, renter households, entitled by law to federal assistance don't get it. If you wonder why you have a homeless problem in Seattle, there's your answer. But I'm talking about working people who aren't eligible for federal assistance, the janitors at Amazon, the people who work in the food service place, because Amazon's got a lot of low-wage workers. How about housing for them? So that's what my book is about, is like, if you're gonna be a progress, call yourself a progressive city, and say you promote inclusion and diversity, then you have to change your land use policies so that you're not pricing out those same population groups and telling them that it's okay to commute. And I wanna make this point about Seattle because what I think, I, I look at Austin, which I have a chapter on a fascinating city, because Austin is, you know, you know the movie Slacker? Remember that movie? Richard Linkletter, Slacker, no? You know what a slacker is though, right? They made a movie based in Austin called Slacker. Slackers can no longer afford to live in Austin because the tech boom there has changed the whole economic structure. But they had a battle, in a three-year battle in Austin over land use reform, similar to what you've had here in Seattle. Homeowners insisting that we have to keep Austin for Austinites, which is kind of a nativist thing when you think about it. All these people saying we don't want newcomers. Now they're supposedly pro-immigrant rights, but they don't want newcomers. You figure that out in Austin or Seattle or any of the cities. But after three years of a process, land use revision process to make increased density, the pro-housing mayor said, you know what, this has just become too divisive for the city, it's too vicious, we just have to pack it in, give up, and we'll try a new process. So the, the anti-housing homeowner groups kind of won. And you think, well, okay, they made a lot of ruckus and they succeeded, they dropped it this August, but there was an election in Austin this last November and the pro-housing mayor ran against the leader of the neighborhood groups who said, keep Austin, Austin. She ran on a platform of affordable housing, but of course not in any neighborhood that she's connected to, which is a common problem. So you had this, and I talk in the book, Austin's at a crossroads. Where is this election gonna go? Where do the people really stand? Are they gonna go with the mayor who wants to expand housing in other, all neighborhoods, or the one who says, keep Austin the way Austin is? The pro-housing mayor won by 40% landslide. There was a ballot measure that said, if you do any zoning change to increase density, you have to go to the voters. That lost. There was a $250 million affordable housing bond. It won with 70% of the vote. What did that tell me and what should tell all everyone here? Pro-housing is the majority and we've let a small minority, powerful minority, intimidate politicians. They can show up at two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon when you folks are working and you can't be there. But now we have housing activists like you have in Seattle who show up, who miss work to combat that. Some are affiliated with YIMBY groups, others are just pro-housing group. I know in Seattle you have labor, a very involved environmental groups, and that's why your housing has been so successful, I think, in Seattle thanks to your Sierra Club and on Frontera and all the great environmental groups who understand that if we don't build infill housing, this terrible climate change problem is gonna get worse. There's a story almost every day. You saw the one today. Where, what does it say? We're on a uh, highly accelerated path to worsening climate change. The California Air Resources Board came out with a report last week, said for all the good stuff Jerry Brown's done, we're not gonna meet our goals because too many people are doing what? Driving long commutes. So this has become an essential thing for us. It's no longer discretionary. We have to build infill housing. We have to change zoning to allow it. We have to take our public land, like in South Lake Union, and use it for affordable housing. 
I write in the book about uh, this armory in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. Does anyone here follow Brooklyn politics or New York City politics? Anybody here do that? Okay. You know, we have a mayor in New York City who calls himself progressive. Bill de Blasio is always the progressive mayor. Read my, you won't feel that way after you read my book because he had an armory. You know one of those big armories? Takes up like a block. Crown Heights is gentrifying. The neighborhood said, this is great. We can have affordable housing on this block, right, to protect all our residents who are being displaced from gentrification in Crown Heights. What did Bill de Blasio said? Nope, I want it for luxury condos. Our progressive New York City mayor, luxury condos. I, I won't, there's somewhat happy ending. I won't give it away. You can read it in the book. But what the Blasio example crystallizes what the sort of the theme of Generation Priced Out is. We have all these progressive politicians Politicians or politicians who call themselves progressive, cities that identify as progressive, who have land use policies that exclude the working and middle class, the new generation. And the reason it's called generation priced out, and I'm a boomer, okay, just, but boomers, man, we're the problem. I gotta be honest with y'all, we're the problem. Selfishness, and I see it in Berkeley, it makes me sick, it really does. And I wanna just say this, if I have a couple minutes more before we do the interview, uh, I mentioned in the book the roots of neighborhood preservation were very progressive. The first neighborhood preservation ordinance in the United States passed in Berkeley in 1973. And, you know, we had years in this country of urban renewal, destructive bulldozers destroying neighborhoods for private gain, and neighborhood groups rose up to stop urban renewal, which was a great thing. But here's the problem, and I just, I, I you go back and you look at the documents from 1973, and sad to say, but what a lot of those homeowners wanted to stop were apartments, apartments. And I'll tell you what's going on in this country right now, if anyone follows Minneapolis, and where they're finally breaking through single phone home zoning, the phone vote will be next, will be like actually December 7th, tomorrow. Uh, when people say that neighborhood character means that you can only have single family homeowners. That is a elitist, exclusionary, often racist attack on renters. And we need to call it out for that. It's not, neighborhood character is about the people, not the building type. And there's some great stuff on, I, I, I mentioned this on Twitter today that I, I, every time I speak, I advertise at Wedge Live. Highly recommend on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Beyond Crom, but at Wedge Live is more fun because he does videos of the testimony at these planning commission hearings in Minneapolis. And I talk in the book about one hearing, and, and, and again, the demonization of renters without actually saying it. Recently, there's been hearings he, he photographed, uh, filmed, of people coming up and saying, hey, I do all my neighborhood tree plantings. I'm out there cleaning the street. I'm out there doing safe watch. What makes you think I'm not a good, just a good enough neighbor as you are, just because I rent? Does anyone disagree with that? Why are we castigating renters? So there was a hearing that, he, that I describe in the book where, without telling you what was being built, one woman breaks down and cries at the prospect of this thing going in across the street from her. Other people said, who's gonna handle all the 311 calls for emergency services if this gets open? Another speaker said, who's gonna pick up all the mattresses those tenants are gonna leave out there in front of their building? As if they're uncivilized. Turns out it was a 10 unit market rate project in a neighborhood that was 80% renter. This is what we're dealing with. And this is why Seattle, which I have, and we'll get into this during the discussion, I, I think uh, some of you are a little queasy about where you're going, but I think you're making a lot of progress. It takes time to build things. You had the lawsuit for a year holding up the MHA. Lawsuits are hard to stop. Every, every all around America, whenever we try to get more density, more housing, homeowners sue to stop it. And that takes time, but momentum is on our side because the new generation is with us. How many millennials we have here? Because you're the future, you're the hope. That's why I'm so optimistic, because you guys get it. And boomers have been demonizing millennials, particularly in my base of San Francisco. We have a big tech boom. Millennials who come out of college earning, uh, owing fifty to hundred thousand dollars in debt, paying thirty-five hundred dollars for a one-bedroom apartment, and we have boomers saying you're responsible for the housing crisis. 
the boomers whose houses have been appreciating in value and now worth like two million after they bought them for 200,000 are telling the millennials they're to blame. Too much avocado toast. <laughs> Cut it out. You've heard that, right? I mean, come on now. Boomers who were able to get into all these housing markets before the prices went wild. And millennials need our support. And they're leading the charge. They're showing up at those hearings and, and doing a counterbalance. So I'm optimistic. And read my book. I think you will, too. So we'll take questions there. Thank you all. Hey, everyone. I'm Monica. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, thanks to Randy. This is uh, an absolutely fascinating topic and incredibly current. Uh, the news just in the last couple of weeks um, has been about how Seattle's uh, mandatory housing affordability is just got the green light yeah. uh, to move forward to upzone 27 more neighborhoods. We've got six already upzoned. Um, here and some support for that. So there you go. So, um, I mean, Let's start with, I think, and you already mentioned this, how surprising it might be, I mean, nod your head if you agree, that you believe that Seattle is the most proactive city for housing. If yeah. you're in Seattle the last couple of years, it, the conversation and the attitude around it has been, I'm seeing a head, right? Nothing but, I mean, definitely not about feeling good about where things are headed. So I'd, I'd like to drill down with you a little more about why you think we ought to feel proud. What is it that we ought to feel proud of and well, how are we doing I'll, well? I'll you, Seattle builds twice as much housing as San Francisco and you have 200,000 fewer people. There is no city, Denver's the only comparable potentially, that builds as much housing as Seattle. And Denver has not done anything like you guys have done to deal with affordability because obviously if you don't deal with affordability, and again, you don't, you know, I, I'm a big supporter of inclusionary housing where anything that's built has a percentage of affordable units. In Seattle, you have a Washington Constitution that prevents you from doing that, so you have to be more creative. So I think given the restrictions, you can't have rent control, you can't have inc true inclusionary housing. The programs that have come out of Seattle, out of the HALA program, are phenomenal. But of course, you're looking at where things are today versus where they were in 2010. And it seems very, and it seems like, wait, but it's a lot more, and it, it takes time. Amazon's hiring completely distorted the Seattle housing market. Now we have Seattle with the biggest declines in, uh, if everyone reads Mike Rosenberg of the Seattle Times, he's always talking about, you know, where the, Seattle now is the biggest declines in rents and home prices in any major city, because finally the Amazon job hiring has, has declined. And, and I will say, in my book, I've talked about the, the fight for the, the headquarters, to be the second headquarters for Amazon. And I said, whoever gets chosen is the loser. And you know the folks in Queens are not very happy right now mm -hmm. because they're gonna, Amazon comes in and doesn't build any housing. Uh, can I just tell one quick story about yeah. that? Because I, I talk in the book, and these, these, you know, cities need to require the tech companies to provide housing or cities need to get develop, allow, set aside land next to the new jobs to build the housing, obviously, and that hasn't happened. In, Austin, where the Texas Constitution does not let cities prevent demolitions of apartment buildings, many of the many things the Texas Constitution and Texas law doesn't allow, it was 244 units of housing for low-income families right bordering Ladyburg Lake, you know, beautiful lake. They used to go for dog, walk their dogs, have barbecues, great thing. And then suddenly they get all eviction notices. And of course, Texas, they don't have any rent control and Texas doesn't allow rent control. So I discussed the struggle. All these families had to leave. It's a beautiful place they were living. What replaced, what's there now? An Oracle company is there. There's some luxury apartments for some of their workers and an Oracle business, workers, who probably never take dogs down to the, to the lake or have barbecues down there. They're just there to work. Yet Austin's always saying they want to promote diversity. And they want to keep racial diversity. They want to stop being so segregated and they want to promote inclusion. And yet this happens. Mm -hmm. No one from Austin asked Oracle to do anything. That's what's got to change. And you know, that, that's part of the problem with, with, but I think otherwise Seattle, as we head forward, the affordability is going to increase. So let, let's dig into that 
piece that you brought up around corporations. Um, so, so Randy mentioned, you mentioned in your book that really, you know, cities might, we might talk about external forces that impact housing and supply and whatnot, but, but you really assert in the book that no, this is, this is on cities and they really can do enough. But let's talk about Amazon. It's a very, very fresh local topic, uh, this question of what do the corporations that come into a city, what do they owe the city's population in terms of these questions around housing? And you didn't, you didn't bring it up. You, you mentioned in the book, for example, there's no way Seattle could have anticipated the job growth, right? But let's say that you know, whether it's Queens or just another city that's on the brink of the kind of explosion in hiring that we saw in Seattle, what advice would you give them to, to really prepare and take steps? What, what could they learn from well, us? Well, to give you an example, right as we speak, there's, a bat, there's been a, a battle over Google opening, Google's opening another place in Cupertino, 10,000 workers, and a lot of housing activists from San Francisco and the East Bay join with folks in the South Bay to say, hey, there's a, there's a site, a former shopping center called Valco, and they went to get 2,700 units built there. You have to do it in, in connection. You cannot continue to create jobs even, without some balance of housing. And again, that's what sort of, all of you should be a little alarmed about the situation in South Lake Union where your, your city, which has all these issues with affordability, is saying that they're gonna sell this public land in a gentrifying area to the highest bidder and only have, I think, 170 affordable units. That's, that's terrible. And this Mercer mega block, if you haven't heard of it, the RFP is being decided today. You should get on top of it and get involved because you should demand that those that there should be housing for Amazon workers and they should help support it. You know, I just had an event last Thursday. You know who Mark Benioff is? He's the head of Salesforce. Amazing man. I did an event with him and Mayor Breed in San Francisco because Mark Benioff donated $6 million to my organization. And uh, the man is just on a mission not only to spend money of his own money and his company's money to house homeless people, he is calling out CEOs of all the other companies, including Jack Dorsey of Twitter. I hope you guys, if you haven't seen that Twitter war, he made a fool of Jack Dorsey. And all these tech execs saying, money won't make a difference. And he calls them cheap. Benioff calls them out. What you need here in Seattle, and I've talked to folks, apparently you don't have someone like Benioff. You need one of your corporate leaders to call out Jeff Bezos and call out some of these folks who aren't doing their share. Microsoft, I understand, primarily is involved in trying to stop being taxed. But when you have these big companies, they need to show some social responsibility unquestionably. Because Washington, unlike Oregon, like Portland Metro just passed a $650 million housing bond last November, two years after they passed this, a $200 million bond. You don't have anywhere near that money. You have a trust fund, this, this housing thing you've had for years that produces like $40 million a year. And going back to Benioff, um, I, I found this really fascinating. Y'all remember the head tax debate, probably, <laughs> March and April, kind of crazy. Uh, but, but it turns out that in the midterms, uh, San Francisco passed a ballot measure that is a, a, a business tax um, in San Francisco, and Mark Benioff really championed it. He right? championed he a tax his company is going to pay 7 to $10 million more a year. Yeah, and very different circumstances. There's reasons why it kind of, kind of worked there and maybe wouldn't have worked here or didn't. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating example. Um, so I want to bring us up a couple of levels to something uh, that I feel is, is a question that is often skipped when we talk about what's going on with housing really across the country in our urban you know, areas, which is playing out the scenario, right? If, if uh, housing policy is not a thing and everybody just allows what seems to be happening to happen, which is cities becoming less affordable and homes becoming for folks who are on the upper tier of the economic bracket, Let's just ask that uncomfortable question. If everyone else has to live somewhere other than cities, why would that be bad? Well, obviously, people have the right to live in cities, and working people and middle class people built cities. I mean, who, who runs the PTAs? Who's, who are the people who are the uh, uh, girls' softball coaches? It's not the high-level Microsoft exec who's working all the time. And I think that uh, the notion that we would even think about uh, excluding lower-income people from cities is really something we don't even want to consider. And I think that what's happened is we've allowed too many people to look the other way and not seeing that this has all been happening. We've been having this laissez-faire approach. And you know, it's interesting because some people associate the problems we have with development. They say development's gentrifying neighborhoods. But if you look at 
Los Angeles, like Highland Park. Has anyone ever heard of Highland Park? I grew up in LA, I'd never heard of Highland Park. And then suddenly you find out from Marketplace, in 2000, the NPR show Marketplace in 2015, that they considered Highland Park the, the, the new the poster child for gentrification. Nothing got built in Highland Park. It's just that the adjacent neighborhoods gentrify, and then people who can't afford them say, oh, I like these craftsman homes in Highland Park, so I'm going to move there. All those people get evicted. So, you know, it's, it's, you need to be proactive, but I think what's interesting is in Palo Alto, people know Palo Alto, it's where Stanford is. Palo Alto is very clear. They don't care about inclusion. They don't care about diversity. They're very happy being an older white retirement community, which is what they're going to be. They're not going to have schools because no families can afford to live there outside of the students. But Seattle, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, Minneapolis, Austin, this, all the city, New York City that I write about, they all claim to care about diversity. They all claim, don't you guys hear your politicians, when you have a mayor's race, doesn't everyone say they want to be inclusive? Don't they say they want a diverse Seattle? You don't have a, you didn't elect the mayor who said, I only want the rich to live here. No, no one, had, those, they wouldn't have a political future if they told that, if they said that. But then you say, okay, you don't want only the rich to live here. Let's talk about your land use policies. What are you doing to make the middle class and working class of the new generation have a place here? And let's see what the debate is then. Now, what's interesting, if I could just mention that when we have elections, not only the one in Austin where the guy, the pro-housing guy, won by 40%, San Francisco, we had three candidates. The one who called herself a Yimby won the mayor's race. San Jose, very pro-housing. Oakland, very pro-housing. LA, Eric Garcetti is the most pro-housing mayor they've ever had. So I think when voters have a chance, they're voting, they want inclusion, they want diversity, but. A, a small minority of powerful boomer homeowners have frustrated a lot of people at the pace of change. And I understand that I'm frustrated when they sue and, and, and hold up and claim, they always claim there hasn't been any process. Austin had three years of process and people are saying they're rushing this through. You mentioned in the book that, uh, I think you compared it to the bowls of porridge in Goldilocks? Yes. Yeah, so well, right, what is it? That it's neighborhoods... Never, it's never, the temperature's never right. The, the housing's either too big, too small, too wide, too narrow. Mm -hmm. There's never a project they can find support for. It's always just a, if only it were this different. And we have to get beyond that because these folks, I'm sad to say this, at some point you have to conclude, yes, you drive a Prius, yes, you recycle your household waste, but you're not an environmentalist if you're not for infill housing. So, um, thank you. <laughs> I let, agree. Let's dig into that because I think at the at the root of that question um, in your book and in your discussions is this idea of what it what is it to be progressive and inclusive. You talk about how the birth of the neighborhood, um, you know, empowerment movement was was kind of what we might think of as progressive today in the 70s, right? That, that neighborhood associations formed in order to protect urban areas for the middle class uh, with all this period of urban renewal. And you're saying that today, that, that, that that's actually excluding people. Um, but, but at the same time, I guess the conclusion would be that neighborhoods should not govern themselves. Well, I have a question. Is there anyone here who thinks that Detroit was right when the white homeowner said that no African American should allow buy a house? Anyone think that's a good idea? No. Would anyone in anyone in Seattle office running for office espouse an idea that neighborhoods should have the right to discriminate on the basis of race? I don't think anybody would support that. But somehow we think you can discriminate on the basis of class, mm. which is often a veiled substitute for race. Because as the this great study, I don't know if Rick is here, who's on the planning commission, uh, who I had dinner with last night, Moeller, but very good. Yes, this great report which I believe is probably must be available online, Neighborhoods for All, lays out the demographics and people of color are more likely to be renters. So when you say you're not having renters, you're basically saying you don't want people of color in your neighborhood. So this notion that came out of the neighborhood preservation movement that we should decide what gets built in our neighborhood is wrong. There should be input, but I mean, you take it to an extreme. In San Francisco, if you, if you this is true, in San Francisco, if you're, if anyone on your block or in your city, you don't have to be a neighbor, is remodeling their kitchen and has to get a building permit, you can file an appeal. I assume you can't do that in Seattle. You know, you, know, you can appeal your neighbor's kitchen remodel. You don't have to even live near your neighbor. If you don't <laughs> like somebody, 
Someone did, you don't, you know, you don't like this person, you find out where they live, you check what permits they apply for, and you appeal them. And they'll hold up their kitchen remodel for two to three months. I gotta mention this other thing. In San Francisco, you have a development project, no opposition. You don't have to live anywhere near the project. You pay $617, and you're entitled to quote unquote discretionary review by the Planning Commission. Now, you're not entitled to a hearing on, your, on a project, but you're entitled to have the Planning Commission deny your request, which means the projects are delayed three to five months. Time is money. People say, why is housing so expensive? Well, when you have these ridiculous obstacles, you're giving homeowners under the guise of neighborhood preservation, you raise the cost of housing for everybody. Got to stop it. So um, we've got a lot of opinions coming out, you know, in local media around the future of HALA, right? This plan to build more affordable housing through this bargain between developers and, and housing advocates, you know, we'll let developers build more lucrative buildings, taller buildings, we'll change those zoning regulations, but they have to pay into a fund to build affordable housing or include affordable units uh, in the buildings, which you've talked about as, as being a good model. Um, the, the stranger looked at the report you talked about uh, just now, the neighborhoods for all, and concluded, um, and I think this is basically a quote that that single family zoning is a racist policy. That's how no, they put it. Yeah, I and, want to address that. Yeah, and I know Richard Rothstein's book, which I've read, The Color of Law, makes that uh, has left people at that point. I, personally, I don't know that's a productive line of argument when the people I know in Berkeley have never been racist and they've never had a racist bone in their bodies, but they don't want renters living in their neighborhood. They don't want renters, and it's not they're trying to. It's not a race thing. I think that there are obviously many communities in this country where it is a race thing. Mm -hmm. Austin passed its when the GI Bill allowed potentially allowed African Americans to move into certain Austin neighborhoods. Austin rezoned to have a larger lot size so the GI Bill wouldn't qualify, so no African Americans can move in, and they have those same lot sizes today. Today, the same lot size, so there is racially based, but and as a racial impact. But I think, you know, in Seattle, people probably don't think of themselves as racist. In Portland, they don't think of themselves. So, you know, if you want to sway people, that might not be the best approach, but we know the impact. The bottom line is when you say you don't want renters, you're basically saying you want a wider city, mm -hmm. and a wider neighborhood. So I was going to contrast that, that take with um, uh, the Seattle Times ran an editorial that was basically talking about Seattle is a city of neighborhoods. Y'all have heard Seattle described that way. We're, we're proud of our neighborhoods. We're proud of the identities they hold, right? And so they talked about these neighborhoods as they are, are what makes this city special. And when we think about- I read that, I read that right, editorial. Right, when we think about what, what folks, you know, want to preserve, you know, it's, it, there, there's no sort of clear malevolence there. There's there's a, an investment in a, a beautiful place to live. You know live. what? I don't think exclusive communities speak for what cities represent. You know, I work in the lowest income neighborhood in San Francisco, a neighborhood, if you read my book called The Tenderloin, Sex, Crime, and Resistance in the Heart of San Francisco, I explain why the Tenderloin will never be gentrified. And it's between Union Square, it's between, everywhere around the Tenderloin is multi-million dollar stuff and how we preserved our neighborhood, of, uh, which is a very large neighborhood. And people love the Tenderloin because it's authentic. I have people, guests from all over, we have an authenticity because we don't have a pottery barn in every neighborhood. You know, you, you go to the gentrified neighbors, they all, we don't have a Starbucks. I know you guys say like Starbucks, but it, you, know, you know what I mean. It's, it sort of symbolizes homogeneity, you know, now it's like, and, and, and everything. We don't have any chains in the Tenderloin. And, and so, uh, unless Phil's Coffee is considered a chain, that, it opened up before it was a chain. And do you have Phil's here in Seattle? No, okay. So, my point is that we have authenticity. So the notion that people say that, that somehow having elitist and exclusionary single family home neighborhoods is what Seattle represents, no it doesn't. That's not my interpretation of Seattle. Seattle was a place where the working class and the Boeing factory and the workers and the maritime industry built the city. It wasn't upper income workers. I mean, that's, that's just a weird, re and, and what's happened is a lot of those folks who bought when it was cheaper. I've seen the appreciate, yeah, beautiful neighborhoods, but I took a pictures when I was in Austin of these neighborhoods that only allow single family homes. They had a big demolition wave in Austin as they've had in other cities. And people always say, if you let you know, fourplexes come in, we'll have a wave of demolition, stop the bulldozers. 
Well, they have a lot of bulldozers in Austin. They're demolishing historic single family homes to build monster homes, 40 feet high. And if you look at these places, they're ugly or no architectural character. We could build a much more prettier fourplex. You know, so architectural design and architectural character is not based on the size of the building, it's based on the quality of the architecture. And I think that, you know, I will tell you, I appreciate the Seattle Times ran a book review of my book that Nick Licata wrote. I'm very appreciative of the Seattle Times. I think it's great they have Mike Rosenberg writing that stuff, but editorially, they do cause problems because they're really, <laughs> They're, they're really out of touch with current reality in, in abiding by a 1970s pre-climate change assessment of their city. They, they have no need, they don't explain how their vision is consistent with greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And, and I don't know if they've addressed that. I must have missed that editorial. So, so jumping, jumping off that point, um, you know, we talked about Seattle as a city of neighborhoods and, and the, the Times has sort of reflected that perspective. And you, you brought up the very interesting question of, you know, that's not how I see Seattle. You know, how do we define Seattle anyway? Who gets to define who Seattle is for? Is like a deep down question at the heart of all of this. So when we think about, you know, Queen Anne, uh, I spoke with somebody who lives in Queen Anne. Uh, neighborhoods like Queen Anne sort of feel like a small town within a big city, right? So are, are we saying, are you saying sort of that that era is over of the small well, towns and the big cities that I mean, we just have to, let's we can't be go honest back. that if you look at, you know, I don't know the Seattle neighborhoods that well, but in San Francisco, the neighborhoods that restrict apartments, you know, there's not that much land. They're not going to have that many apartments that are going to be built just because of the nature. So the, the, the character isn't going to change. And here's the great thing. And I don't know about Queen Anne neighborhood, but in all of the historic, I'll give you an example. The most famous photo, if I said to you, what's the most, outside of the Transamerica Pyramid, the most famous photo of San Francisco is a row of Victorians on Alamo Square with downtown in the background. I see people nodding their heads. Can you envision that picture? They always show it. Did you know there's an eight-story apartment building next to the, the house on the right? Nobody knows that because it was taken out of the picture. Now, what if we all saw that eight-story apartment building? Maybe we'd say, hey, that, is that hurting the character of Alamo Square? It doesn't seem to be. All of these neighborhoods, and probably true in Seattle, in the 1930s built fourplexes, built apartment buildings. It wasn't until the 70s and the 80s and beyond that they were banned. So when we're told that renters hurt neighborhood character, but our neighborhood is so great as it is, well, renters are there. Renters have made your neighborhood great right now. We gotta recognize that and not, not get, but with this fantasy land that the, I, I read about the Queen Anne, their arguments, and, and it's, it's hard to take it, is anyone here from Queen Anne? I don't want to insult anybody, but I'm sorry. But You know, like, I found it like these people are literally detached from reality. They're like, they're following a script. And here's something I learned in writing this book. Literally, when I say a script, it's almost like there is a script. What they're saying in Minneapolis, what they're saying in Austin, what they say in Los Angeles, Portland, San Francisco, Berkeley, Seattle. It's almost the same. The, the signs are the same. I love when they say everyone is welcome. They have these yard signs. Everyone's welcome unless you're a renter. Hmm. That excludes a lot of people. Hmm. So this is what why I think we need to be really open. You know, I, I want to make another point that I think I have the only book written about gentrification that talks about homeowners stopping housing and apartments. I mean, too many of the books on gentrification are all about evil developers, bad landlords but they're missing the complicity of progressive elected officials and progressive voters in sustaining exclusion and promoting exclusion. And that's why I think my books, that's why I wrote the book. Cause I said, I don't want to just write another book about evil developers. Let's talk about the homeowners who don't want anything to get developed. So I'm going to ask uh, one more question and yeah. then we'll open it up to your questions. Um, so be thinking about those. Um, so we've, we've been talking about, you know, the, the, the perspective of folks in neighborhoods um, uh, up around all this. So I'm curious, since you have worked in this space and you've studied cities around the country, what have you seen as the most persuasive argument for uh, somebody who question. comes from the neighborhood perspective, great loves question. where they live, really invested, doesn't see the point of jumping into uncertainty, I um, think, I think but actually comes around, I guess, I think to your point of view? People say to me, how do you get the boomers to come around? And I think there's two arguments. One, the environmental community is waking up. 
Now you you don't realize because you're in Seattle. You guys are you, your environmental community is so on top of it. You've been, you're so far ahead of of, of of of. I mean, our Bay Area Sierra Club uh, uh, supported a CEQA appeal to change that, turn the parking garage into housing. So you've got a great group of conscious environmentalists here who understand the link with housing. But so we're going to get some more as climate change worsens and the reports come out. More and more boomers are going to realize, hey, this is a problem. I see the connection with infill housing. But also, like we find in San Francisco, particularly with our immigrant families, the boomer, the people my age, they want their kids to be able to live somewhere near them. And if they have grandkids, they want to be able to see their grandkids. And if they're having to live in Sacramento instead of San Francisco, you're not going to see them as often. And I think people are starting to realize a lot of the immigrant families in particular, we have a big West Side population of Chinese American immigrants, they all want to live near each other. And they feel like their kids are being priced out and they're not happy about it. So I think we're seeing a change there. I think that is driving a lot of it because for the first time ever in cities like Seattle and San Francisco, the, the parents who are the boomers here, their kids can't afford to live here unless they have a really high paying job. If they're millennials, you know, if they have to buy now or even rent. And so it may be fine for some people to say, oh, just move into the suburbs, just, we just take that long commute. But you're just not going to have the family connections that you once had. So I think the combination of the environment and the family, and that's why the momentum is moving in our direction. All right, thank you. I very quickly want to address the word character. I got back, <laughs> this is crazy, I got emotional about this. I got back here in 1980 after leaving university. The 80s in this city was heaven. I'm not kidding. There were th people in their 30s and 40s, created people with energy. They didn't owe $200,000 for, for, for college fees. If you can get the 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds good apartments in a good neighborhood that has character to it, it's a great thing. I, got, I was 25 in 1980. I was the most creative-minded, wonderful example of American white malehood. It was incredible. You need people in their 30s and 40s living right downtown. And it wasn't just because of the music. It wasn't because they, they made pottery. They had full-time jobs, and they brought flavor to this city. And we're losing it. I do not want to live around Amazon employees who made 200000 a year and live in a new four-story condo. I don't want to live around those people because they never leave. They never leave their homes. They never leave their homes. They go to Amazon at 6 a.m., they come home at 7 p.m., they sit in front of their flat screen television, exhausted. Mm -hmm. They never go out. Well, you know, I, I will say thank you for, for making the point, though, that I, that I keep emphasizing every time I speak or do any interview, is that neighborhood character is about people, not about building type. Mm -hmm. And as he pointed out, when you're telling renters they don't, they lack character. There's some great on Wedge Live at Wedge Live. There's some great footage of of tenants in Minneapolis passionately challenging the homeowners who said they don't have character. So you should take a look at it. Hey there, I definitely agree with rent control, but I'm just wondering uh, what would be a good counterpoint to um, this interviewer or this interview that I heard where someone was against it. They were saying that well, if you have rent control. Uh, that means that it actually encourages landlords indirectly to be slumlords because if there's problems with the apartments and the rent is uh, that they can collect is at a certain price, then they might not be able to fix A, B, and C, and it leads to substandard housing because they can only collect so much in rent. What's a counterpoint to that? Well, I will tell you that when, when I've been involved in rent control since it started in California, and I'm, as I've been involved, done, run a lot of rent control campaigns and passed a lot of, written a lot of rent control laws, so obviously I'm a big supporter. But when rent control was first on the ballot in California in the late 70s, they used to always show pictures of the South Bronx when it was burning in the 70s and said, that's what rent control brings, because the South Bronx had rent control. The reality is code enforcement is a separate operation. Landlords are legally required to maintain their buildings and they can't not do so. So, you know, the reality is in a place like Seattle or San Francisco, but take Seattle right now, if you, if you start a rent control tomorrow, rents are still at a very high level here. 
and it would take, so you, you, know, you need to start it. I mean, I wish, I, again, I know there doesn't seem to be the, the clamor for rent control in Seattle that we had in, in many California cities and that we keep adding cities in California because our rents are so high. But ultimately you have to ask yourself, you want to have stable communities and we, in Seattle, if a landlord wants someone who's been there for 20 or 30 years just to leave, all they have to do is double their rent and that person has no right to stay. I don't personally find that moral. I mean, I think we need to, and I think you build, like what's great about my neighbor, the Tenderloin, why, why everyone is there low income, they're all under rent control or under nonprofit ownership. So we've taken so many units off the speculative market, we haven't had displacement. But that's why, so I think rent control, but the problem you have in Washington, the, the state law, and which passed in 1980, Thing, things were a lot cheaper in 1980. Maybe it's time, you gotta revisit it because they, they abolished, they said they, they abolished rent control in 1980. And now we have a very different housing market. So thank you for raising that. Hey Randy, great talk, thanks. Um, this is actually extending beyond the city, but it actually builds on this question of state law as opposed to local law. And as someone who is a high energy engaged person at multiple levels of government and is looking at what's happening nationally, maybe you can help us out here and have some tips. We have two things at the state level that often make us feel like we're swimming upstream. One is the Washington State Environmental Policy Act, which ironically is environmental legislation passed in 1971 that is now being used to delay and thwart some of the most progressive environmental land use policies we're trying to put forward. And the second thing is we have no state income tax, yielding well, us yeah. one of the most, if not the most regressive tax structures in the country. Do you, you know, have any tips? I got to tell you, during, might address that? during my lunch, I, I was in you know Oregon before this and hearing about all the great stuff going on at the state level there. And uh, during my lunch today, everyone was telling me that Washington is really anti-tax. And because I said, why don't you guys pass a, a billion dollar housing bond? And it was like, all right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the fact that Metro Portland just passed a 650 million bond and you're living on just crumbs here in, in Washington. So, and now you have a different legislator. So I think there needs to be more pressure. You know, there's not, often not a lot of activism at the state level. Washington has a problem California has. If the state capital were in Seattle, you'd all go to the hearings and get all involved, but it's in Olympia. Ours is in Sacramento. We have CEQA too, and I'll tell you, there's a, there's a, a bill you might have heard about was introduced this week. California is going to become much more pro-housing because we have a, a, a governor that is gung-ho to change every law to make it more housing. I heard your governor is a little different, uh, just not as passionate about anything, pretty much. But <laughs> but uh, I, I would say this: uh, at the federal level, it would be really helpful. There's going to be an effort, you know, more money would, is always good. Thank you for your comments. But I think, let's give him credit for being part of this great document, which has really changed the debate in, in, uh, in, in Seattle. Uh, there is going to be a campaign, you know, to, now that Nancy Pelosi is in charge of the House, to really dramatically increase HUD funding. Because the reason you have this homeless problem in Seattle, we just never, I was here in 82 in San Francisco when the homeless problem really proliferated when it began nationally. We've never gotten the money we to solve it. And that's why it keeps getting worse. If you never get the money, but now we have a chance for a much better budget. So those of you who are inclined to be thinking outside of what you can do locally, get involved with the groups working at the Senate level and, the, and your Congress member to get them on board to dramatically increase HUD spending. Cause that, that's really, really critical. Uh, yeah. Hi, um, so in the debate around the head tax here, there was a local entrepreneur that came out uh, in opposition to the head tax who was associated with very like progressive uh, restaurant franchise. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the alternative solutions they proposed was um, pro or encouraging business owners to donate to nonprofits because they said that addressing housing affordability was not the core competency of the city government. So I wonder if you could speak to the efficacy of tax dollars versus private donations. Well, private um, donations, private donations don't work. I mean, I mean, okay, so I just mentioned Benioff gave us $6 million, but that's for five years at least, and the city will have to pick it up. If the city wasn't picking it up, then it, it wouldn't happen. I mean, 
the private dollars can do you know particular things as a shortfall in one project a nonprofit needs some some gap money they can do some things to make a difference they can acquire a site but you know in 1949 our country passed a law that said that uh, the federal government was responsible for providing housing for all Americans we haven't done a very good job at complying with that law have we it's almost been forgotten think of our ambitions in 1949 and then in the mid-1970s, Richard Nixon decides, because of racial reasons, he didn't want to have, in, people, people didn't want public housing because it had to be integrated. Uh, we get out of the public housing business, unlike any industrial country. We just decide in the 70s, no more public housing, and then we don't fund public housing, so the ones we have, the units fall apart and it gets bad attitude toward public housing because the, the government didn't fund it. And then we've been, the 80, Nick, uh, Reagan's 81 HUD budget was decimated affordable housing and things that we've never gotten the money back in real dollars. So I don't think people realize, because in America, when a problem continues for too long, many assume, oh, we tried to solve it with money and it didn't work. This debate we had in San Francisco over this Prop C, where we doubled our annual spending on homelessness by taxing the richest corporations, the thing that Mark Benioff supported. It was amazing to me how many people who are smart people said, well, obviously, homelessness has been on, going on all this time, so obviously throwing money at the problem doesn't work. We never threw the money at the problem. Never. I mean, today, 75% of eligible households don't get federal assistance. I mean, is there another 75%? So, and that number has gone like this, because we don't spend the money. So, uh, yeah, the private sector can't make it up, and I think it, it's good, for, but it, it's good to get the donations for the reasons I said, the gap financing here, the buying of a space here, shortfalls and the like. Hi, um, I was wondering if you had anything to say about housing variability. Um, so like I live in Cap Hill, um, which I feel like does a really good job of making like a lot of like studio and one bedroom units, but um, I'm almost 30 and a lot of my friends are starting to have families and as they start to have families they move out um, because there just aren't there isn't the housing variability within the city to give them the room to grow their families I'll tell you why in. because it's more profitable to build studios and one bedrooms just the economics and and you know again uh, I write in the book about the Seattle development process compared to San Francisco, and yours is so much faster, so much cheaper. I know, and I quote some developers, one of them couldn't be here tonight, and I, I know that it's frustrating if you're in the development business. It seems like things are expensive, and things like things take time. Read what I write about San Francisco, you won't even believe it. You know, it takes, you're lucky if after you apply for it to build something, you get a planner assigned to it for six months. It could be a year. You just, you, nothing happens for a year. Meanwhile, you're, you're paying interest on the land you bought. So I mention that because, so what happens is, due to the cost issues, developers start thinking, well, I'm gonna build what's the cheapest, and you get more money, because if you add up what the total rent from a building with studios and one bedroom, is more than two bedrooms. That's, that's really what happens. But you're right, I mean, you have this Queen Anne's group even opposing ADUs. So we talk about variability, you know, in-law apartments. We talk about trying to get variable housing, and, and that's really, you need housing, of course you need that. You're absolutely right. That's why people leave, because they can't get those units. But do we have, but do we have tools to, to combat that? To well, you can, you can have incentive programs. You could say if you build a two-bedroom, you can, you can affect how the inclusionary works. There's a lot of ways you can do that. Uh, I will tell you that some, there's a counter-argument to building two bedrooms, which is that, oh, four students will live there. Four single people will live there and it won't necessarily lead to families. So it's not, there, there's kind of a lot of issues around that. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a project that they're being built in the neighborhood I live, which is all two bedrooms, and they want families. So it isn't, it, some developers see a way to do it. Do we have more questions? Yeah, go for it. So we have a city council race coming up in 2019, and starting probably in spring, we're gonna have tons of candidate forums and candidate questionnaires. What are two questions around apartment bans that the media moderators and others should be asking candidates for office for city council in Seattle? You know one question, I'm glad you brought that up, Lori. You know one question everyone should be asking? I have a question for someone here. Why do you guys have elections in 2019? <laughs> Can someone give me a good reason why? Because an argument I make in the book in the LA section, in Los Angeles, 
They used to have these off-year elections just like you have. And the most two most recent off-year elections in LA, the voter turnout was under 20%. Now I understand you have mail voting, so it's, it's higher. But when you have off-year elections in Los Angeles, who do you think votes? Is it Latino tenants in Boyle Heights or homeowners in Bel Air? I think you know. And so what you had in Los Angeles, which is a very fascinating city, it's one of my, uh, Seattle and Los Angeles are really exciting opportunities to write about and get into. But you had in Los Angeles is you elect these city council members and they're only gonna listen to the homeowners because it doesn't matter how many tenants they have in their district, it's who votes in that off year election. So in 2015, they got rid of the election, off year elections. That was the last one. And so Garcetti, Mayor Garcetti's term is gonna go an extra year and the next mayoral election will be in 2020. I would strongly encourage Seattle to get off this 2019 because you're just encouraging and empowering the small minority of voters. And I understand that uh, some of your students aren't even here when the election takes place in 19. It's not even during when school's in session uh, at University of Washington. So I'm just saying students in particular and younger voters who are more inclined to support housing are more likely to vote in state and national elections and far less likely to vote in local only. So change that. That's what I would say to change that. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, do you have any examples of municipalities or cities that have done a good job or have managed to con change single family zoning to multifamily zoning? Well, it's happening in Minneapolis right now. And like, it, literally. What, what is an example and, of and, that? And I think it's a great plan uh, the, the, that took, again, a long time, but a lot of good organizing and they've really increased density. But I think Seattle is moving in the right direction in other parts as outside of the single family home neighborhoods. We're gonna be doing that in San Francisco. There's a bill, the state bill, SB 50, was introduced this week, you might have heard about it. It was, it was, and this bill is going to basically legalize apartments in almost every major city in most of the cities. Because the way it's written by Scott Wiener is it's within a half mile of a transit area or a light rail stop. And if you just pencil out how like San Francisco works, virtually every street is within a half mile. He also threw in the wealthy neighborhoods, which was fun because, you know, you know, a lot of people say the only housing that gets built is downtown, the tall high rise apartments, they're not affordable. You've heard that, right? Like, what's the point of building housing that's just high rises? Well, what you want to do is build as many housing units as you can in gentrified neighborhoods because there's no risk of displacement. They're already gentrified and you're creating opportunities for the working and middle class to get in a better neighborhood. So this bill will do that. Now, I actually recommended to Scott when I met with him back in September and gave him my ideas for how to pass this thing, the one thing he ended up doing different than what I suggested, and he was right and I was wrong, I said to him, look, we're not gonna build any housing in Bel Air. You know Bel Air. Mike Davis, the author, described that part of LA as the Sunset Bolsheviks. The folks who live north of Sunset in LA in these massive mansions uh, who enforce a discipline around housing in their, in their city that insists on single family home zoning. I said, I don't think you should touch those folks because nothing's gonna get built there anyway and they're so tight with Garcetti, they're gonna finance this presidential race, it's not worth the fight. But he was right because in my reading of the reaction to this bill, the one thing everybody loves is the wealthy are gonna have apartments. So I think it's changing, but again, Washington, you know, you don't, what I'm told, and correct me, you don't have a person at the state level, maybe Guy Palumbo is the one, but you don't have like some of the leadership. Like, we elected a governor who says, who wants to build 3.5 million homes, Gavin Newsom. Now, it was pointed out, well, that's more than like California's like ever built in its history. And he wants to build it in his first term. So he had a high, high goal, but he is like in there, he's already said, we're gonna spend 500 million on affordable housing. He's gonna pass the Wiener legislation. So. If you elect people who are really zealots around housing, we can get a lot of results. Can I close with one question? Yeah, um, so you mentioned earlier that uh, Seattle has a lot of talented urban thinkers. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could, you know, for those folks here who like to follow that scene, who, who would you shout out? 
Well, I get in trouble for not mentioning everybody, but I'm a big fan of Share the Cities, who is here, Laura Lowe, and, and I have her in the book. And you have, you know, you have the Sightline Institute. You have so many of these, these folks who, uh, I mean, again, the Sierra Club, all, all the stuff. I mentioned many of them in the book. And, and, and Seattle for Everyone does a great job. I don't know if anyone's here from Seattle for Everyone, but, you know, you've got layers. You have some inside people who deal with politicians. You have the outside people. And I think it's all working. And I think three years from now, things are going to be better than what they were. I think you went through a very difficult period because of Amazon just distorting the whole market, and it takes time to build. 2012 to 2017 was the worst, and I think you're going to see better times ahead. So we will see. If I do a paperback edition, the paperback edition of my book, maybe I'll have to add some stuff saying, hey, Seattle people are happier, because I understand why people feel now like, hey, things are just way too expensive. What's this guy talking about? Things are terrible. I get it. Feel the same about San Francisco, and it's never going back. The days where Mary Dodge had come here with her husband who wrote for the race, Daily Racing Forum, those folks are going to be priced out unless we do the, the mandatory housing program where they can have an inclusionary unit. But the market rate units, the prices are up, but we can make more affordable ones. They can add, they said, six to 10,000 units through that MHA program, and that's a lot. Think of that. That's 20,000 people makes a difference. So I want to thank you all and happy to talk afterwards and also please buy the book because uh, Elliott Bay has come here in town hall and it, it's great to support the local bookstores. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.